Hello folks, my name is Marcel Elfers and I want to discuss, I am a master profiler through written communication and I use handwriting analysis, statement analysis and behavioral trend analysis. Handwriting analysis gives us an idea about the personality traits of an individual. Statement analysis provides us with insight about the core perspective of an individual, whereas behavioral trend analysis provides us with insight regarding a priority theme. I wrote my book, We Are the Same. It's the details that differ back in 2015. It's a book about personality types, and it's an overview of behavioral style motivation and predictability. In this book, I lay out case, several cases, including John Benet Ramsey, George Zimmerman, and Elliot Roger. The John Benet case has intrigued the world since 1996. And there is a very good reason why, and that is because the intruder theory, which was provided and still is provided by uh, the Ramses defies all logic. Moreover, the second theory floats around, which is about the pedophile ring, and there is no foundation whatsoever regarding a pedophile ring. Of course, pedophile rings do exist, but there is no link to this case other than some hearsay and an um, anonymous phone call. The most crucial piece of evidence in the case is the two and a half page ransom note left behind. And of course, when you look at the ransom note that is two and a half pages long, that is odd in itself. Because kidnappers typically bring a note, most often typed, but the basic, it says, we have your uh, child, we want your money, we'll uh, contact you. But two and a half pages is not only odd, it's also now the most crucial piece of evidence left behind. Now, when we look at the very first paragraph, we see that the handwriting is really distorted. It is shaky. Whereas the last paragraph, it is smooth. And that strongly suggests that the note was written by someone with a non dominant hand. And that means that the author tried to disguise the writing. And you try to disguise because you're afraid it will be recognized. The question then becomes, does a random intruder who nobody knows make a point of deception like that? The note was also signed with SBTC and notice there was no period after the C. That is really interesting because SBTC supposedly is the name, acronym for the name of the foreign faction that kidnapped her. Now, when you are part of a group and you sign your name frequently, SBTC, then you expect the last period to be there. And that is because placing the period would be highly habitual. And that strongly suggests that SBTC was fabricated. It was not habitual. Now, most people who write acronyms also don't use periods at all. So the use of periods is a little odd in itself. The case did not start with the ransom note, but it started actually with the 911 call that Patsy made at 5.52 in the morning. And that call was odd in itself. Now, there is a rule in statement analysis. We always talk about that, what is important to us first. And so here is a transcript of the 911 call. Interestingly, the first thing that Patsy mentioned is the address. So apparently that was the most important thing to her to mention the address. And she continued by saying we have a kidnapping. A is nondescript. A kidnapping, it could be your dog, your cat. But A does not refer to your daughter. And then 
she repeated line five in line seven by saying we have a because she was interrupted she was distracted so the repeating of the same sentence implies she followed the script it was rehearsed and therefore the call is inauthentic the script of the uh, the message is inauthentic next thing she says there is a note left that's again nondescript and our daughter is gone now i want you to pay attention to the word gone gone means it's lost cannot be found gone also means somebody's dead and this may be leakage meaning somebody said something that slipped out because of its meaning its emotional value of the word in line 13 patsy says just found a note now here's a really interesting phenomenon people that do not use the personal pronoun I in a sentence, do not want to own the statement. They don't want to take responsibility. And now in line 13, it's my daughter is missing. Now missing means it can be found, it's misplaced. So the word gone changed to missing. And a change in word is a change in reality. So first it was gone, cannot be found, lost. And now it is missing, can be found, misplaced. The operator asked, does it say who took her? And she replied, what? When, you, when a person uh, answers a question with a question, they are buying time to think about what to say. And finally, in line 17, Patsy said, it's a ransom note. So now she defines the note. She had multiple opportunities to create urgency for law enforcement to help her out, but she didn't. As you can see in line 18, even the operator was a little surprised. So Betsy told us what the starting point of the investigation is, and that is the home. Incidentally, as we will find out, or you probably already know, John Benet's body was found inside the home, and that is the starting point of the whole story. Typically, when a 911 caller who has an emergency and needs help does not ask for assistance for the victim immediately, is either involved knows what happened and protects someone or is the guilty party. So John Benet's body was found at one in the afternoon and she was in full rigor mortis. And that means that she was probably dead for eight to 10 hours. And we don't know the exact time frame. And that is because uh, rigor mortis can be a little bit delayed by cold or speed up with warmer temperatures. However, the Ramses were all that time minimally cooperative with law enforcement. And oddly enough, they agreed to a nationwide televised interview with Brian Cabell five days later, January 1st, 1997. 
The first question Cabell asks is, why did you decide you wanted to talk now? Because it was already clear they did not really cooperate with police. And John Ramsey said, well, we have been pretty isolated, totally isolated for the last five days. But we've sensed from our friends that this tragedy has touched not just ourselves and our friends, but many people. And we know that there's many people that are praying for us, that are grieving with us, and we want to thank them, to let them know that we are healing and that we know in our hearts that John Benet is safe with God and that the grieving that we all have to do is for ourselves and for our loss. But we want to thank those people that care about us. We talk about what is important to us first. What is important to us is a priority. And so John bought time to think about the rehearsed statement with the word well. John Benet was killed through strangulation with the garrote. So that is a willful and deliberate murder, which John now refers to as a tragedy. The word tragedy implies it was an accident. It was unintentional. The word tragedy for the willful murder is not a good match. It is downplaying what happened that night. And then he wants to thank the people that prayed for them and thank those people that care about us. John, Patsy, and Burke. Burke is the son. And so, a pattern established itself for both Patsy and John. Patsy in the 911 call mentioned the address first, made it a kidnapping, a note, and the daughter is gone, which later became missing. John's priority was to tell everybody that they were isolated, that it is tragic, and to thank strangers. Apparently for both parents, John Benet was not the utmost priority. You see, what I would expect is that Patsy would be screaming in the phone, my daughter has been kidnapped, help us, please, because that creates urgency to get people to you, to help you. And John, you would expect in the first interview on TV, nationwide televised, looking straight in the camera and say, I'm going to move heaven and earth and I will find you. And you, the public, if you know anything, contact the police, uh, uh, Boulder Police Department. Here is the phone number. That is what you would expect. But no, that's not what they did. In my upcoming book, John Benet, the final chapter, I will analyze the ransom note and the circumstances. And I will explain in detail who wrote the note and why that is beyond a reasonable doubt, why the note was written, because there was a hidden agenda, and what most likely happened that night, which is linked to the signage SBTC. Handwriting comparison analysis will show us who wrote the note. There is significant evidence of that. Statement analysis will show us that the note was written by an inept criminal. The author of the note had no idea what the criminal looked like. 
the note shows evidence of alibi building that was part of the hidden agenda. And the note was also written to divert attention away from the real killer. The ransom note was deceptive all along, and I will go into detail with that at a later stage. Evidence has shown us that the two and a half page ransom note, odd in itself, like I said, was written inside the home on a notepad that had doodles written by Patsy. And that means that not only was the uh, ransom note written inside the home, a kidnapper could not have brought that pet along with them because there could not be any doodles in there. A second interesting piece of evidence is that the note was written after John Benet was dead already, or believed to be dead. And that's interesting, because a kidnapper would not kill the child deliberately with a garrote. Then write, after the killing, a long note, inside the home that it must have taken 45 minutes to an hour and then leave the body behind. Why write a note when you leave the body behind? These two things do not match. You either take the body along with you because you need the leverage to demand your ransom money. Here is some evidence, one of many, where it shows that whoever wrote the note was an inept criminal. Now remember, the note was written inside the home after the child's demise with the parents sleeping upstairs. And in the note, the kidnapper, the alleged kidnapper says, the delivery will be exhausting, so adv I advise you to be rested. Who on earth, within the context, knowing that the parents are asleep upstairs, will write, I advise you to be rested? They don't need that advice. They are resting. And that strongly implies that the author is not only an inept criminal, the author did not experience the kidnapping scenario. They are imagining things. And so there's only one conclusion. Based on the note and other evidence, there was no intruder. There's also, like I said, a hidden message in the ransom note. And that hidden message can be summarized in a balance of power between two individuals, two main players. You see, when you look at the ransom note, there are three distinct parts to it. In the first page, the author took charge they were uh, demanding, you will, you must, you will, you will do this, you need to follow my instructions to the letter, blah, blah. In the second page, there is a shift because the author mixes words of kindness, I advise you to be arrested, the gentleman watching over your daughter, with 
a multitude of death threats. And on the third page, especially the last paragraph, the author gives up control and leaves John in charge. It's all up to you now, John. And so the author of the note had a specific agenda. The agenda was a message to John and also to convince law enforcement the child was still alive, which was not true. And so the hidden message of the ransom note can be explained in these few sentences. Listen, your situation, it's up to you now, John. S-B-T-C. In the next episode, I will dive a little bit into the analysis of the ransom note. I will explain and show you who wrote the note, why the note was written, and what happened that night. And most importantly, what does SBTC stand for? I'd like you to like, share, and subscribe to my channel, and follow me in the case of John Benet the final chapter.